Most Sundays, Papaw Koi could be found sitting in one of the two chairs strategically placed under the shade tree that stood near the edge of a bluff overlooking the gently sloping hills that led to the valley in the distance. I had been watching him from the kitchen window as I helped Granny Tollett finish up the dishes. Granny, I'm gonna go sit with Papaw for a spell. You see, this was Papaw's favorite place to think, and uh, he always seemed to be thinking. I had long since learned not to ask what was on his mind. The way I figured, if I sat there quiet enough, he would just come right out and say it. And with that in mind, I took the empty seat and waited. Yes, sir. This world sure has changed a lot since I was a young'un. Papa Coy started out. Everything was different then, and we had different things to worry about back then. Why, wow, I can recollect when a big mud hole kept mountain folks awake and worrying all night. They couldn't sleep for thinking of it. A mud hole? I asked as Papa was busy whittling away on a stick with his old-timer pocket knife. How on earth could a mud hole keep people worrying, Papa? Oh, if you'd have seen it, you'd know, he said as he shook his head. I reckon I was the only man that ever figured out how to get the best of that quagmire. I was just thinking about it before you got here. It was a train that put me in the mind of it. I was sitting here, just looking down in the valley, watching that engine pull the cars around the mountains, ducking in those tunnels, and coming out again, and then streaming around all those ledges. The railroad hadn't been built up here in the mountains back in those days, when the mud hole kept everybody worried half to death. You'd be surprised what a difference that railroad made. When folks had to sell anything, like a load of apples in the fall, or a wagon full of vodka, they had to hitch up a team of mules to a wagon and drive down the mountain trails to some city down in those lowlands. And if they had a drove of hogs or a herd of cattle, those critters had to travel to the market on their own feet. Folks just had to get them down there themselves. And roads weren't where they are today. In some places, they were just cow tracks. Sometimes the shallow creek bed was all the track there was, and folks had to drive along it until they came to some passable trail. Down in the flat country, it was a little better, but even there, it wasn't any picnic to travel. It was muddy when it was raining, and dusty as all get out in dry weather. Oh, I can tell you, getting your stuff to town in those days was a troublesome business. Folks used to come back with things to tell, and one of the things they would talk about was the mud hole. It was at the foot of a long slope that sort of eased down from the mountains. The road entered the big woods about there. The trees on each side of the road had never been touched by an axe, and they grew in rows on both sides, towering up like black walls, all tangled with vines and bushes. The road was just a little cut through this here trackless woods, and the rains rolling down that slope just seemed to dam up there. The water didn't drain off, and the sun never struck through that wall of trees to dry it. It was gloomy in there all the time, and it got dark a long time before the shadows, so all the water just stayed and soaked into the ground. It sure was a mucky mess, wagons and buggies cutting through it, horses and mules and critters trampling through, churned it all to a big heavy black cream. Everybody going down from the mountains got stuck in it, and they had a heck of a time getting out. There was a man I knew that rode into the mud on a mule, loaded down with sacks of corn, and the mule just began to mire. The more he floundered to get out, the deeper he sank. If that fella hadn't been pretty quick, that mule would have went clean out of sight. Clean down to China, I tell you. But the man grabbed the bridle rein, and he threw it over a limb and tied it there. He reached around and grabbed a holt of the critter's tail, and he scrambled off to the side of the road, still holding on to that tail. He took a half hitch and wrapped it around a sapling, and held on. The mule just hung there by the head and the tail, like a hammock slung between two poles until a party of wagons came along and the drivers pried the poor beast out of there with poles. That's right, there were signs of trouble all around that mud hole. Prying poles laying everywhere. Baggage that had been thrown out to lighten the load. Clothes and shoes that people had to take off, all just thrown away after they had been floundering through the muck up to their necks. And the mud hole was big. Half as long as a city block, I reckon. A bottomless trough of mud. A sinkhole that just got worse all the time. Folks starting a trip would be studying about the mud hole before they left home, a wondering if they'd get through it, hoping there hadn't been any rain down that way lately to make it worse. They used to travel in pairs to have help just in case they went down. Did you ever have to go through it, Papa? I asked. Well, of course. The first few times I had to cross that mud hole, I had trouble. I can tell you that 
One time I was coming back from Charleston, way down on the coast, and I was loaded down with iron strips that the blacksmiths used up here in the mountains for rimming wagon wheels. And those iron strips made a heavy load. And when I got to that mud hole with them, the wagon just began to sink clean out of sight. I had to skip out of there in a hurry and cut the mule's harnesses or they would have been dragged down with the wagon. And that was the last I saw of that load. It disappeared into the mud without nary a bubble. So the next time I set off to the lowlands, I naturally began to worry about that mud hole. I had a load of apples on a two-horse wagon. Now that was heavy enough, but to make matters worse, I had me a passenger named Mel Honeycutt. And he was tall, about six feet or so, but more so the trouble was, oh, he was fat. I reckon he weighed 300 pounds. But as big as he was, he could get around pretty swift, even with all that weight. I was wondering for sure how I'd make it through that mud hole with that heavy load of apples and mail sitting there in the front of the wagon. But I've always claimed that if you put your mind to something, you can think your way out of any difficulty. Well, I put my mind to it. And just like I told you, I thought of a way to get over that mud hole just as clean as a whistle without even getting the wheels muddy. How'd you do it, Papa? Well, of course, it took some figuring, I have to admit. But here's how I did it. In the first place, I had a right smart of a big wagon, and I loaded it heavy in the back. All of those apples were piled high up at the rear end. I reckon if I'd thrown one more on the back of there, the wagon would have stood up on its hind wheels like a dog begging for a biscuit. Mel and I got in the front, and we started down the mountain. Now, he had heard of the mud hole like everybody else, and he was aware of how we were going to get through it. So, when I told him my plan, he was glad to promise to help me out, and he said he'd do just what I told him. Anyways, directly, we got down to that incline, and we started down to the mud hole. I got out, and I unhitched the mules, and I tied them to a tree. Then I folded the wagon tongue back so I could hold it and steer with it. And I got in, and I sat down, and I reminded Mel of his part. Now, he was nervous, but willing to give it a try. The wagon had already begun to roll down a hill. Now, it wasn't any trouble to steer it because the wheels just naturally stayed in the ruts of the road and it began to pick up speed as we went down. By the time we got to the bottom, we were going so fast that the wind was just cutting both our ears off. And just then, I saw that mud hole looming almost under our wheels and I yelled at Mel, Jump! And he was ready and he was game. He gave a leap toward the back of the wagon on top of all those apples, and it did just what I thought. The back part of the wagon went down, and the front wheels lifted. Well, sir, that wagon sailed up into the air. The speed that we were at, it just went soaring, just like we were shot out of a cannon. And when I saw we had made it, I hollered, Now! Old Mel just scrambled back to the front of the wagon, and that made the front wheels come back down, just as pretty as you please. And then we stopped. I got out and blocked the wheels to keep it from rolling back into that mud hole. Then I walked back to the edge of the road, where it was fairly hard enough to let my mules over. And we got right through it and hitched on and went on. I tell you, it's too bad there wasn't anybody around to see how we flew over that puddle. Seems like I never could load my wagon just right to do it all over again. And old Mel's done moved out of the mountains now, so he never was around to help me out again. And folks never believed it happened. But I tell you, it sure did happen, just as sure as I'm sitting here. Just then, Papa Coy had finished up carving his stick.